the reason why I wanted to do the podcast is because because I I also thought the education is important mm-hmm. and. The reason why I'm doing fun of fun, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons is, as your point, I think LP community is going to become bigger and bigger than before. And I, I actually feel it, right? For example, let's take a look at the number of LPs for single fun. It's easily more than 100 LPs per fun, uh, especially when it comes to emerging majors. There's a lot of individuals who put in like, like 50K, 20K. Um, to all the way to, you know, interested investors like us putting a million dollar, right? So, and I just had a coffee with one of those, some uh, lady who I met uh, in VC Lab, uh, this like, conference. Mm-hmm. And she said, like, she never invested in venture, but she's now interested in investing 250K to a venture fund. So I think those new generation or new demographics who are interested in investing in venture capital funds is going to only increase. And education is going to be important. It's going to be really important. And I know a lot of people are doing that. Plus, uh, the brand, right? When people think about fund fund managers or, or whoever, right? Um, the podcast is going to give great opportunity to learn or teach something, but also a good way to build a brand, right? Um, I think one of the questions you want to ask was about brand. And I think brand is becoming more and more important for VC community. Um, so in a sense, that the social media, not only for podcasts, for TikTok, uh, building a brand um, is going to be really important in podcasts. It's, again, it's a good, really good thing as well. Superclusters is the podcast to demystify the secrets, stories, and tactics behind the money that moves the venture capital world. Young Rock Kim is the partner and head of investment at GRI LP Fund. And that is GRI spelled as G as in girl, R as in rabbit, and double E. And which focuses on backing both early and established managers and is an LP into 60 plus funds, including names that you're familiar with, including Upfront Ventures and NFX, but also into phenomenal emerging managers like Behind Genius Ventures and Hustle Fund, just to name a few. He has since departed from his Goldman days and has been in the venture world since 2016, where he joined Arch Venture Partners focused on commercializing technology businesses. He then found himself at Recruit Strategic Partners. And while you may not have heard of Recruit, you've definitely heard of some of the companies in which they own. And if you've ever been a job seeker ever in your life, you've probably touched at least one of their brands like Indeed or Glassdoor. Recruit Strategic Partners is the corporate venture capital arm of Recruit, where Young Rock served as senior vice president before he dove first into the world of being an LP, which as you all know, is the sweet spot of super clusters. Throughout the next hour and some change, well, I promise we'll get deeper. But without further ado, Young Rock, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Davey, for having me. That's a very, very uh, generous introduction. I like it. Hey, you know, you've got a lot of things going on in your resume that I've we're going to dive much into, but I'm sure everyone's like very impressed by it, And I think you should be impressed by it as well. Um, Sounds great. So I mentioned in our pre-chat that I've been fortunate to chat with a couple of GPs you know well, and they've been incredibly helpful in seeding some questions for this podcast episode, um, in which the lens... nervous? Yeah, and in which the, the lens in which <laughs> you're seeing the LP, L- L- LP world, but also investing into venture as an asset class. But before we get there, I want to start into the world of teenage young rock. Um, so if you'll humor me for a little bit. As someone who has been a fan of the legendary Eric Clapton and someone who owns a poster of Metallica in your home, and even more interestingly, you flew across the East Sea to study the art of rock music. How do you describe the appeal, the musical appeal of J-Rock to someone who doesn't know the difference between X Japan and X the social media platform? I hope uh, a lot of people know the difference between X Twitter X and X Japan. Uh, but yes, uh, thanks for asking the question. No one asked that question before. <laughs> um, so, you know, when I was young, um, there's a two things I, I there's three things that I am really interested in uh, when I was a teenager. One is Japanese. My dad used to speak Japanese, uh, was he used to speak Japanese, uh, a little bit of his background. So he's a, he started his career as an engineer at LG, uh, which is a Korean you know, electronic companies and back then back in 1970s it seems like lg has two tracks one is a u.s track the other one is japan track because those two countries are the one with a you know high technology you know when it comes to household 
electric equipments. So he chose Japan. Um, so LG taught him Japanese and all this stuff. So he speaks Japanese. So I, I influences. So I, I was into, always interested in Japan uh, and Japanese. And the other one is rock. I don't know how I got this, but um, I just fell into rock music uh, since when I was 12 years old. So I always listened to this rock music, including Metallica, Eric Clapton, and all those other rock groups, like Green Day. Right? Um, the other one is computers. Um, so again, my, my dad was an engineer, so he bought me a computer when I was like eight years old or so. So um, I um, yeah, I played mostly games, uh, but you know, I played around MS DOS things, DIR, MKDIR, all those commands. I still remember. Um, so I, I just really like it, you know, playing around with computers. Um, so those three things are the one that I really liked it. And when I was in high school, like any high school students, I just, you know, want to do something cool, you know, um, and stand out among the friends. And combining those three things, um, well, except computers, I thought like, oh, maybe, maybe I should go to Japan, where uh, rock music is more popular than in Korea. And then play music there. It has a bigger market, and I like Japan. And it's only two hours flight from Korea to Japan. So I told my dad, "Hey, um, I'm gonna quit high school and go to Japan um, to play music." And then obviously my dad was not happy. And my mom was not happy either. So they gave me a counter offer, which is, "Why don't you go to college and study computer, which you like as well? Then I will give you, I will buy you whatever guitar you wanna buy." So, huh, that's a good deal. And back then, you know, buying a guitar, expensive guitar, like $2,000 guitar, is, is like very, very difficult. Cool. Um, so I thought, okay, that's, a, let's, let, that's the deal. So I studied it a year and a half, really hard, um, and got into college in Japan. So that's how um, I ended up being in Japan, actually. Um, but, you know, um, and I, I, for the two years I played, I didn't really go to school. Uh, so my GPA is very um, interesting number. Um, <laughs> That's a great way to put it. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a very different, um, you know. <laughs> so, but I had a lot of fun, uh, and I met a lot of good friends, and, and that's actually helped me to quickly learn Japanese uh, compared to other external international students, because you know I always hang out with the live band members uh, playing music, you know, having fun. So. That's uh, that's how all it happened. But um, you know, I um, as a Korean citizens, uh, all healthy Korean male have to go to so have to serve for army uh, or military services, right? So I had to go back to Korea for two years um, to serve the country, and that was the time that I um, that I realized, you know, um, maybe there is another way other than music, right? Uh, because I singing all my band members uh, who graduate the college and start working for all those companies, right? Semiconductor companies, or this, you know, uh, uh, entertainment companies. Stop it, you know, and, and they all stop playing music. And then, and I that that was the moment that I okay, uh, maybe I should find a job as well um, and study more. So I you know, went back to my computer. Uh, I I major computer science anyway. So. Uh, I went back to school um, and took a classes a little more seriously and started studying English as well. Um, and then that's how I ended up being, uh, um, you know, where I am now uh, initially uh, from rock musician uh, career. Skipping and, and, and bookmarking another part in what you just said was like you picked up Japanese pretty quickly um, while you were in Japan. Was it because that your 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 dad also learned Japanese and I don't know if he was speaking at home or was it because that you were just immersed in the country or was it due to a large fact that even though you spent you were in the country you spent a lot of time with band members and you were seeing Japanese songs and naturally you, you've come to understand the language a little bit better than than other folks who are coming in from other areas that's an interesting question so this happens to me twice uh one in Japan one in the US you know David you see a lot of international students in college and here in the U.S. as well, right? And trust me, when they got into school, their English test score is one of the highest. Otherwise, they cannot get into school, right? Yeah. And a lot of people, including myself, when I got into college because I have 
after I passed whatever this Japanese test, you know, score, I thought I'm really good, right? Because I passed the bar, right? But in fact, you know, some international students are really not good at, you know, speaking English yet. But again, trust me, they passed the bar. And it was just the same for me. So initially, I thought I'm, my Japanese was really good, uh, but it turned out I'm not really good. Uh, I'm not, there's a huge room to improve, right? So, uh, but luckily, as I mentioned, I spent a lot of time with my friends, band friends, uh, music, music friends, and I just had a chance to immerse into this Japanese culture. Um, so that helped me to learn, you know, I already had this foundation because I passed the bar and then I was able to learn actual, you know, language, the conversation language, uh, through, this immersive experience with friends how i like i'm gonna be honest like sometimes when i sing songs in other languages i'll just remember phonetically what it sounds like but i may not Mm. have an idea of like what it means what that means right um i'll be honest i had a chapter in my life back in high school where k-pop was just starting to get big um right and a couple friends and i got like really into it for a period of time and so we just start singing k-pop songs and i'm to be honest i have no (laughs) idea what i was saying i was just literally saying the text on the screen and that was all there was to it so for you for japanese how did it how did you reinforce like the the learning the understanding of the language other than just the words in which you were saying um i think it's a combination of spending time with the native speakers plus conscious effort right so I always have this word uh, dictionary. So whenever mm-hmm. I learn something new word, I just take a note, uh, you know, even during a conversation with the friends, right? And again, it was, I got into college in back in 2002. So there's no iPhone, whatever. Uh, I always, you know, carrying this small uh, electric dictionary. Um, and, you know, so try to spend more time as much as time with the friends. But actually for that part, I didn't really put effort because I always playing the music with the friends, right? So I just, you know, schedule the meeting with the friends to go to the studio. And usually after studio, we just grab a beer or food. So it naturally, I, it allowed me to spend time with those people, uh, uh, local people, right? Um, and then again, I, uh, whenever there's expressions and, and words, they were kind enough. They were young enough to teach me all this, including a lot of slangs. Actually, I was one of the, those you know, few one of uh, you know, national students who knows all the slangs in Japanese. Um, because, again, it's like these are musicians. They know a lot of these, these expressions of slangs, right? And um, I just took a note of them, right? Um, and try to memorize them whenever, whenever I can. Um, and I did exactly the same things when I came to the U.S. as well. I do find a lot of music. I mean, naturally, music is poetry. Like, if you took out all the, the melodies and the harmonies, like, mm-hmm. very simply, a lot of music, if not all music, is purely poetry. And poetry right. usually has a great way of expressing language in a way that um, you can't find on the dictionary, you can't find in the classroom. And so you may pick up on slang and different terminologies and synonyms and antonyms that you may not have realized otherwise. Um, I also ask that question quite selfishly um, for myself. Um, But also, I know a lot of LPs out there, I guess GPs as well, who are approaching foreign investors, right? LPs approaching foreign markets and emerging markets going like, I want to invest in emerging market fund in Latin America or Africa or Southeast Asia and all that kind of stuff. And the biggest barrier often is the language barrier. And I've actually had, this is actually a conversation I've had with multiple LPs where they're like, oh, well, Mm. I mean, so I I, I speak Mandarin as my second language. And um, they're like, what's the best way to pick up Mandarin? Like I'm going to like Hong Kong, Taiwan. Like I want to be at least proficient enough to be able to communicate or at least crack jokes with the- That's an ambitious goal. It's an ambitious goal. It's a very ambitious goal with the locals and whether that's VCs they want to be investing into or whether that is, um, you know, LPs in which like GPs are approaching because they want to build common ground. And so that's why I ask. And so it sounds like if I can summarize this, um, the best way like that you found was carrying a dictionary and listening to music. And every time there was a certain phrase or slang that you did not understand, either have good friends to help you there or... Go find your way into urbandictionary.com or somewhere else to find what that slang means. Yeah, exactly. Pretty much, pretty much. And try. I think uh, one other thing is culture, right, David? You know, 
the language is is culture, culture's language, right? Um, so we say different things even for hi, right? Uh, when it comes to different culture and country. So understanding those culture context is going to help us to learn the language and better communicate with those people, um, especially when it comes to Asia, which is very different culture from Western culture, right? Um, and even within Asia, Japan, Korea, where I know the culture is very different, right? And when it comes to China, I just came back from Hong Kong two weeks ago. It's very different too, right? Um, so try to understand this culture context, you know, in Asian slangs is, I think, uh, uh, as the key to win uh, some friends and eventually the market as well. It, it also, the, being in the culture, cultural immersion helps you learn a lot faster. And you're totally right. Different cultures have different mannerisms as well. And I'll give an example. Yeah. I was chatting with a teammate of mine here at Alchemist, um, actually, yesterday. So at the time of this oh. recording, yesterday. And... Right. Um, he said something that was very interesting, which is, I mean, he and I, not, neither of us speak Japanese natively, mm -hmm. but we have interacted with a lot of people in the Japanese market, whether it's VCs or LPs or founders and mm -hmm. all that. And one cultural aspect, you might think like, oh, what if I just Google translate things and it'll, it'll mean exactly the same. The culture affects mannerisms. And what I mean by that yeah. is in the, the order in which, and you can correct me, you speak Japanese more fluently than I do here. Um, but the, the order of the sentence in Japanese is subject, object, verb, not subject, mm. verb, object. Yeah. And the reason why that's important, or at least that's what my colleague said, and I, that makes sense in my mind, is when usually in English, when I say subject, verb, you already know what the sentence is going to be about. You can predict yeah. where the sentence is going to land. Whereas yeah. in Japanese, I can say young rock, David. And you have to wait till I say the verb to fully understand what yeah. is the relationship between young rock. You got to wait until the end. Yes. And so culturally interrupting people in Japanese is actually very rude. And it makes a lot of sense because in Japanese, when you're speaking it, um, you do not know how the sentence is going to end until the very end. And you're making too many assumptions if you are interrupting. And that culturally yeah. translates a lot when Japanese people speak English because they expect to finish their sentence before you come in. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really great point. Yeah, and and another thing is even for the same word, sometimes it's a different cu cultural context, right, or nuance, right? For example, in Japan, people say difficult, and difficult means no. Let's say like GP pitches whatever DAG or fund to LPs, and and if they say difficult, that I wouldn't say 100%, but most likely it's, it just means no. Uh, but difficult means here, is it difficult, right? <laughs> so, so people ask like, hey, uh, then what, how, how do we make it easier for you, right? Yeah. I mean, that's a fair question, but it's not the right question for them because they already say no, yeah. right? Um, so, and, and understanding the cultural context and nuance, it really helps me, uh, helps people to, understand what exactly the words, specific words means, right? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, I think one of the thesis is, I think is the VC investment is always considered local business, which mm -hmm. I think changing. Um, I think it becomes more cross-border. Um, and I think uh, there is more, you know, uh, uh, exchanges of capital, human uh, 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 resources and, uh, and information. And understanding those different culture, uh, you know, will be more and more important. I think. I hundred percent agree. I hundred percent. And like going back to like what you mentioned in Japanese, like difficult means no. It's the same thing as when I when I cook for my parents, and my parents came from you know um, East Asian backgrounds and all that. They will never say this was really good. They will never say this is great. What they will say is, oh, this is not that sweet, and that is another huh. way of them saying this is good. Um, because wow. it is really hard, at least in, in Chinese culture, it is really hard to give compliments to another. And so we'll find other ways to give compliments without actually saying the compliment. I didn't know that. Wow. That's fascinating. Look, so, I mean, like Chinese culture is, it's, it should be similar to Korea, Japan, you know, right. But still, I don't, I don't, I didn't know it. Um, that's fascinating. I also don't want to like, generalize across all of china because yeah, of course, that yeah. is like a billion people and even more speaking that language but i will say in my family like i've learned that us saying certain things are clues 
that actually means something else. Right. We can go on and on about this, but I don't want to bore our uh, listeners' ear on the topic of language. Um, I did mention earlier, and I, I did mention that you made a couple leaps of faith to go from Japanese guitarist, uh, like <laughs> being the next Hide or Pada, and I might be misrepresenting those pronunciations, those names, but instead of those long, flowing locks of hair and a leather jacket with the guitar, you landed yourself into investing in emerging managers at Gree. Yeah. Talk to me about that transition because you got into venture capital, as we said in the introduction, in mm-hmm. 2016. Right. And this was both like, you know, you were you were looking at the venture capital side, you're looking at the corporate venture capital side. What was the tipping point where you're like, all right, I don't want to be a VC. I want to be an LP. Mm-hmm. What was that tipping point? So uh, when I started uh, as a venture capitalist at Recruit Search Partners, by the way, that's gone now. I don't think it exists now, uh, but it was quite active back then, back in 2017. And I, out of college, I got a job as an engineer at Goldman Sachs uh, because I did computer science and because I wanted to work for an international company in Tokyo, mm-hmm. not Japanese local company. So I was lucky enough to get a job at Goldman. Um, and because of my background, and, and again, I got a job at Recruit Search Partners in 2017. And 2017 is the year when the crypto, uh, the first boom hit, right? Um, and we, I had a discussion with the team, you know, I have a background as an engineer in the financial industry and now it's crypto. So maybe I should spend some time on the crypto, right? So I became a, a lead, uh, uh, on the crypto, our investment arm. Um, so that's the first thing, right? And the second thing is, you know, it's the 17, 18. All the crypto funds are not all, most of like 90% of the crypto funds are emerging majors because crypto itself is new, right? There's are some funds who were created before 2017, but I think less than five. Uh, but everyone is founded 2018, 19-ish. Um, so effectively everyone are emerging majors. So because the market is new, we decided to make investment into the funds as well as a startup directly. Um, so I had a chance to meet all those Crypto funds, crypto emerging majors in 2018. Uh, and we made investment into a few of them. And fast forward, I saw how quickly those funds became uh, really influential we see in the crypto space, right? Uh, not only as a brand that we uh, will discuss, but as a actual the, uh, the capital return, right? Um, and then I thought like, oh, this is really interesting. In fact, it could be from a risk profile perspective, the um, the fund investment is much has a much lower risk profile than the startup drag investment. But the, from the return perspective, it was almost a similar uh, because some of the funds return a double digit return. Um, so then rationally, the fund investment might be better than startup investment of the venture capital. And if it happens outside of the crypto space, that could be really, really interesting. So I did some research, right, outside of the crypto, and then I found, okay, it's it doesn't happen. Often, but there's a, some cases that, you know, those some emerging measures became really, really influential in a quick, uh, short amount of time, return a lot of money, right? So I, I saw this opportunity with the major measure from that experience. Plus, it was 2020, uh, at the time that I decided to go uh, do the uh, fund of fund. And as we all know, 2020, 2021 is, you know, you know, the cost of the capital was the cheapest. Everyone's raising the capital. Um, and number of VC firms has been increased significantly, right? And I thought like, okay, uh, if I do the venture capital now, it's like jumping into the like red, red ocean, right? The so competition is going to be really, really fierce. But they all need capital. So what if I go one layer above when they, where they are, right? Mm-hmm. Then it kind of be kind of blue ocean because there's a demand from those number of VCs, right? So those two things, right? One, I saw the opportunity to emerge majors, and two, given the number of VC firms has been increasing significantly, I thought the fund of fund emerging major, emerging major fund of fund could be very, very interesting. Um, so that's how I ended up uh, fund of fund managers. To add a little more color here, so I set up my management company here um, and started raising you know, my experimental fund. I was targeting around five mil to 10 mil. 
to back those emerging majors. And, you know, I started knocking the door to those LPs. Actually, I should have done what you thought, what you've done, David. I didn't, I talked to like only five, six LPs, not 80. <laughs> I should have talked to 80 LPs. Um, I just did a quickly check the water check and I thought like, oh, they could be interesting. So I just, you know, quit the company, uh, my the previous job and start raising the capital, right? Uh, but as we all know, raising capital for a fund is, is not easy, right? Um, and there's a lot of emotional you know, up and down. Uh, but one of the conversation, one of the, and, and, and during this person, like the first couple of months, um, I met Gui as a prospect of peace. And, you know, as usual, I pitched them my fund of fund, uh, which is going to invest in the emerging majors. And, um, long story short, they said no, but they gave me an offer uh, to lead their U.S. fund of fund because that is the time that they want to start their own fund of fund as well. Uh, for Gree, uh, you know, David, as you mentioned earlier, so they made a more than, now they have, I think they more than have 80 funds investment. Mm -hmm. uh, the homepage information is a little up to the, uh, uh, is not updated, but I'm they are definitely one of those. Yeah, yeah, they're one of the largest fund of fund in Japan. Uh, so they have a really a good experience and presence, but not in the U.S. way. Um, so they want to find someone and I show up asking for money. So um, I ended up joining them to lead their fund of fund program. Um, yeah, so that's how I ended up from rock musician, guitar, list, who whose aspiration is to become a hide become uh, Emerging Major Fund of Fund. I'm gonna seed the word research in your mind right now because I wanna double click on that okay. eventually. But before I get into that, um, you mentioned you pitched Gree to be an LP in your fund and they said no. But instead they're like, actually we'd love for you to lead our US initiative when it comes to investing in funds. Right. What did that conversation look like? Did, did, were you just pitching and in the same meeting they were just, hey, we're actually, we'd actually love to hire you. How did that conversation roll out? I didn't know this, but they already made a decision internally that they're going to do the US fund of fund. So they were actually searching for someone and they already had a job posting like a couple, I think a few weeks before we, I spoke to them. Um, and then, you know, but I just, you know, regardless, because I thought that's, that's not relevant. Um, I just pitch them, and the first conversation was is completed. You know, I pitch them um, and it's done. And the person that I spoke, uh, you know, uh, has you know had a conversation internally with the group folks, and they uh, uh, they asked me, hey, um, actually, you know, we have this process and a job posting. You could be really, really interesting candidate. And uh, why don't you? And you can consider our my pitch meeting as a like first first interview or something. Mm -hmm. And you already passed it. So why don't you uh, just for for their record perspective, right? Uh, why don't you just record your name on their job posting you know, site, right? So I did it. Um, and then after that, I spoke to Pete Quickle, um, and they said yes. Uh, they uh, went with me. Um, so that's how all the conversation happened. Yeah. I want to go through your mental game during that state for a while. Your mental yeah. game, you're in the meeting with a potential LP and they just said right. no, but you should probably look into working with us. What yeah. was going on in your mind at that point in time? Were you like, no, I still want to do my own thing or I just want to be an LP. It doesn't matter where I, where I am an LP. Like what, what was going on in your brain? So actually, I was open to multiple ways, right? Mm -hmm. I was okay to, as long as I can exercise this emerging major strategy, right? Mm -hmm. I think, and, and, and because it's an experimental fund anyway, five to 10 million fund, I think it didn't matter. It mattered less about how I can achieve that, mm -hmm. right? As long as I can build, uh, and, you know, uh, execute the strategy. Whether it's my own fund or it's managing someone else's money uh, as a single LP or as a uh, uh, just helping as advisor to invest it in, it, it, I think it mattered less. 
Um, so when they told me, um, I was okay. Uh, let's consider it. Like let's see what options they're gonna give me. Right? Um, so I was pretty open anyway. Um, yeah. So it was not like oh, I'm not, I'm not gonna consider it because because again, I was open to multiple options anyway. And it's a bit. And one other aspect why the reason why I open to multiple option was um, you know I I'm a, I'm married to this my beautiful uh, wife uh, and I was given one year to raise the fund well to to have the first close right uh-huh. uh huh to before we spend or our savings uh, right um, so I mean obviously we have more than that right but like one year is I think we 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 thought is good enough time that we can you know maintain our quality of life but still uh try something new right mm-hmm. um and then when i met gui he was i think like three months in four months in um, wow so yeah so i i still had a time right mm-hmm. but that kind of conversation as you can imagine takes time right yeah so even after we had a conversation you know the final conversation I wanted to make sure that I can okay execute the strategy that I wanted to do right um, and, and there's a lot of conditions and terms right so it took another couple of months to mm-hmm. finalize all those stuff right um, and it was already by then six months in seven months in um, so I'm gonna give I'm gonna have like only three four months um, so I thought, okay, maybe, maybe, and it was very generous terms. Uh, basically, they're gonna let me do what everything, what, what I wanted to do. Um, so I have only four months now, and this is something I can do, um, what I wanted to do. So why not, right? Uh, so that's another angle. Uh, from family perspective, uh, influence my decision. Okay, we're going to go heavily off schedule here because I gave you a list of questions before that and we're going right, to take sure. a little detour before we get back to that. Sure. Which is, I'm so fascinated about the mental game and the hiring process over here. Um, so I do want to ask about the hiring process because I think a lot of LPs, as they're hiring external fund managers, that is something they're also thinking about. Mm-hmm. The flip side of this is... To your personal, to, to play very anecdotal to your personal life, like you started the conversation three months into your fundraising process, um, mm-hmm. you ended the conversation like four months before your deadline, which effectively gave you what is that? Um, like five months of just back and forth. Yeah, four or five. Months, yeah. Um, and I'm really curious, as you were going through the interview process with Gree, were you mm-hmm. still pitching other LPs with the potentiality of raising your fund? Or were you like from three months and you're like, actually, this may seem really good. I'm going to put all my eggs in this basket. So in the beginning, yes, I was still talking to other LPs, right? Um, and But as the conversation shapes into uh, what I think both parties are interested in and one, the amount of my time and research to talking to other LPs diminishes significantly. Yeah. And at the end, I got, we, we finalized the final offer July, uh, last in 2021. And around June, I, I don't think I was talking to any LPs, uh, actively, at least new LPs, uh, by then. What did the hiring process look like? Why did it take four five months? What were they looking for? What did the second conversation look like? If you can share some some light into this, I think our audience would be pretty da- damn thankful. I think interview itself was only a month or two. Okay. It's all scheduling, right? Um, so, mm-hmm. and I had a this first conversation after, two, and, and two weeks later, I had another conversation, and another two weeks, I had another conversation because I talked to, you know. Uh, People, including senior uh, exec, agree. Uh, you know, just scheduling takes time, right? Yeah. Um, so, I, but still, I think it took like a month or two, uh, or so. I think two or two, three months, mm-hmm. and then remaining a month or two is uh, finalizing the terms, right? Uh, for example, I wanted to raise the capital outside the group, mm-hmm. um, and that was one of the conditions and. I want to make sure we are going to, you know, build a fund like a GPLP structure, not investing from the balance sheets. Um, so those, those, it's not only my own terms, but in, it's also the fund structure 
and what fund can do, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it take it took another month or two uh, to finalize that uh, because if if I don't finalize it before I join it, I don't want to you know just surprise myself uh, and surprise other people as well and, and just leave a month or so. And then in that process, you know, it was only a couple interviews, as you mentioned. Most of it was just schedule, scheduling time in between. Yeah. You can leave this up to speculation if it makes sense. But what do you think the team at Gree was looking for when they were interviewing you over like two, three, four, five, whatever time, number of times? This question, I should have asked it. Like, what, what are you looking for, you know? <laughs> because now they, everyone is so close now, right? I, I will closely all of them now. Mm -hmm. uh, but... um. I think um I think one thing they appreciate is you know I do this because I really love it. I'm all in it, right? I'm going to do fund of fund emerging major for venture capital fund of fund in the in the next 10 20 years. No matter what. I I'm in, right? And I think um I think they felt it. Uh I mean like I'm the one who quit the job and start my own fund of fund. Yeah. Right? Want to start a fun fun, right? So that alone shows how I am serious, uh, how I'm serious about the fun fun, right? And I think that they really liked it. Um, and the fact that obviously that I have experience both in investment in startup and fun, and I speak Japanese, I used to work for Japanese corporate, so I know how to navigate the, the Japanese corporate world. Um, so I think that's all combination. And I'm already here, right? Um, they, yeah. they even was thinking to hire someone in Japan and send it to us. Mm -hmm. uh, but they don't need to do it because I'm already here. Um, so I think it's a combination of it. But I think the most important thing is uh, they they wanted to build their business, not short-term, but long-term as well. Mm -hmm. And I am I was, I think, the most serious person about it. They knew there weren't going to be high turnover. It wasn't like you were going to be more missionary than mercenary because exactly. you just very much believed in the industry and that some that at that point speak about timing like aligned with the strategy in which they wanted to deploy into the u.s exactly exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay i want to go back i did mention I, I did tell you i was going to seed the word research in your mind All right so we're going to go back to that um and this also goes pretty closely to i was chatting with uh mark at upfront and he's like i've got to pick your brain about how you think about data and research in the LP world as well. And I think what you mentioned earlier, which is like investing in crypto managers and all of them were emerging managers, to be fair, because crypto yeah. was such a nascent industry. But as you were doing your research, and let me know if I'm misparaphrasing here, but you found that the folks who got to influence really quickly, at least in the world, were more likely to outperform. And I'm right. curious, at least for this case study, this example, how did you pull the information together? Like, where were you going to look for such information and, and, and bring that together to, to build a thesis upon? So I think um, the challenge when it comes to fund investment or LP investment, as, as you know, David, and, and every, every LP knows, it's all hidden, right? Yeah. Um, there's not many public information. So you'll have to rely on word of mouth uh, or limited source information or expensive information such as speech book. I'm a like I'm a religious pitch books. I because you know that's a, one of the few platforms that I can get a lot of information about the work that I do. Right? Uh, we use so a, a multiple other, other uh, data sources now, but like it's limited in short. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think I rely on everything that I have: uh, pitch book, uh, Crunchbase, you know, the databases like that that people know. From uh, uh, to you know talking to I didn't talk to many LPs but I talked to a lot of my friends in this GP uh, uh, in the venture capital space right um, to learn about like whether or not there is opportunity uh, and to prove out you know my thesis is right huh? so I talked to a lot of my friends who is in the you know venture capital community and just reading a lot of this publicly available information. One of the thesis is that. If you look at 2016 when I got into the venture capital, and, and I, I, I started interested in venture capital community in 2014 and 15. And if you look back 2014 15, there's a lot less information about venture capital. There's no resources. Even if you wanted to learn like what the venture capital is, it's really, you know, um, not many. But look at now. 
there's hundreds of information, and it's so easy to learn about the venture capital work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying doing the venture capital work easy, but getting the information about the venture capital work is so easy. There's so many resources, so many classes, on, including a, a program like on deck, right? And no one really wonder about like first refusal. It's just, it's just like simple Google, right? It's going to return the, the result. I think the same thing is going to happen to LP space as well. Now, the amount of information is limited. But people like yourself, myself, is you know, democratizing the information about the LP space, right? So I think of doing the research on the LP space as a, a you know fund investment is become more and more accessible. And I think once that happens, and and going back to the uh, venture capital, now what they what all the venture capital says, they are all data driven. Everyone's data driven, right? Mm -hmm. This is the difference is like how they use data, right? Yeah. Um, and that happened because a lot of data and information is available now. Again, going back to LP space, now the information and data is becoming more and more available. Yeah. Um, and I think the next step is going to be data-driven LP. Um, I'm biased because I started my career as an engineer. Um, so I think, um, so that's why I spent a lot of time. I we are actually just hire an uh, engineer uh, who is going to build a platform, a data-driven a data platform. Um, and I think the way we do the research is from, again, that I'm, in the past, what I did is public resource, um, and talking to friends and data source like a pitch book from, from these three to more data driven research, more sophisticated research is going to be the way, you know, people in the LP space is going to do more. Uh, uh, I think the people, there are parties already doing that, right? And I think this is only increased down the road. And we hope and, and I think we can spearhead that effort as an LP. I love that. And I love the framework of that. There are like three places where in which you can find information and data in order to inform effectively your perspective. Um, one is right. publicly available information. Two is conversations in which you have. Three is pitch book. I want to dive a little deeper in here, and I'm going to give some examples, and you let me know if I'm directionally accurate. So, going on the earlier example of like the like the influential crypto manager and building a thesis around the fact that hey, you know what, um, the most influential, the people who rise to influence fastest are the folks who are more likely to outperform. What I'm imagining is. In terms of publicly available information, that is probably, I don't know if Twitter still has it on their bio, but you used to be able to go on Twitter Twitter bios and see when they joined Twitter. And then you would look at their audience size and probably like you would take that publicly available information, like let's say they have 10K followers and they created their account in 2019. And that probably means a lot more than someone who has 10K followers who created their account in 2000, I don't know, nine 21. or something, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and so that's an example of, speed but also an example of where you can find publicly available information how do you parse through that data that everyone has access to but how do you how do you read that um yeah am i am i directionally accurate there in terms of like the approach yeah yeah i think that when the when we live in the abundance of information right um how to get the insight uh, from the data and information matters right i mean yeah. the, the velocity or speed is one of the insights we can get right um and the insight is is driven it can be driven by different research methodology and a model right um so yes i think uh, i think we are directly in the right direction okay um and conversations can also be a function of brand and we talked about that earlier and we might bring that back into conversation in a bit um the other part is uh kind of conversations right um conversations i'm curious here who do you choose to talk to in terms of if you were to priority stack rank their insights versus someone else? Like I'm, I'm gonna be honest, I'm probably more likely to listen to an LP talking about the emerging market space than I am to bless his heart. I love him. Sorry, dad. But more than my dad, who's talking about the emergent mar emerging market space, right? And that's how like stack rank. And like, yes, it's technically a conversation I'm having with my dad. I'm sure he's reading something out there, right? But I'm more yeah. likely to trust someone who's like made money betting on that. How in, in, when you're doing research, uh, let's let's say in this crypto manager example, right? Who were you chatting with in order to build a framework of thinking? For example, for our due diligence reference course, 
I do. Just, we choose the people we want to talk to, usually, um, based on, depending on the questions that we want to find an answer. Let's say, if manager says, hey, um, I have expertise and knowledge and network in XYZ area, and that's the, you know, his or her secret sauce, superpower to source the attractive goods. If that's the, if that's the superpower, and that's the, the one of the key elements to for him or her to be successful as a emerging fund managers, we have to prove it out, right? And we have to think about, okay, who are the best people to testify and verify that statement, right? So we choose the, you know. For, for companies or, or LPs who might be able to, you know, answer, give, give us an answer. Um, so to answer your question, how we choose people is we choose people to talk to depending on the, the, the question we want to find. Um, yeah, and, and strategy as well, right? Um, so for example, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of defense parts, right? Um, and we, in order to learn like what's really going on in the defense, we don't talk to generalist funds. We talk to, I think we already talked to more than six, seven uh, funds whose claims who invest in defense uh, spaces, right? Um, so again, try to find uh, who knows, who we believe knows the subject matters that we want to try to find and, and understand more. So it varies I depending it. on the... So yeah. to kind of repeat it back in other words, and feel free mm -hmm. to correct me if I'm wrong here. Sure. If a manager's superpower is deal flow, uh -huh. the best, most probably most reliable source is our founders in which they invested in. And you would ask them, how did you hear about this investor? Did you go pitch them or did they come and find you? Exactly. exactly. Um, if the manager's, uh, the fund manager's superpower is um, portfolio support, then you'd likely be talking not only to the founders, but also key executives on the team. Where And where was the portfolio, uh, like the, the, the manager helpful in, in helping you scale your business? How helpful were they to get you from the seed stage to the series A stage? And I know those stages are proxies, but how helpful were they for you to get to from $1 million to $10 million in revenue effectively? Um, yeah. If their exactly. superpower is they may not be a lead investor, and they're only a participating investor, um, and they still get deals and they still win deals, it's probably talk good talking to other co-investors who they've co-invested with. And like, why are you letting this person on the cap table? Is there a specific reason as to why? Exactly. Yeah, that's that's exact question that we ask for the value add, right? For, for companies. If they say, like, oh, yeah, our superpower is marketing. I talk to founders asking, what did they help? If they, if they don't say marketing, that's a red flag. Right, because there is a inconsistency, and co-investor as well. Exactly what you said, right? I mean, if I just talk to co-investor like big names usually, right, uh, and ask them why did you let him invest in whatever five hundred k, twenty fifty k, right? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is not consistent, that's reflect. I mean, one inconsistency. I mean, it could happen, right? But if it, it, it happens multiple times, I think that's definitely reflect. I want to I want to talk about questions in, in, in a sec because we're like on the topic of questions. Um, sure. I often and I have a whole like series on my blog named like DGQ, which I guess stands for damn good questions or like <laughs> I, I'm just patting myself on the back. But effectively, I love sharing my favorite questions in this series on my blog. And I often find when my readers can attest to this, I often find myself trapped in the nuance of the question. And so I'm actually really curious as to you, as you're doing references, as you're doing diligence calls, as you're like, you know, talking to investment uh, managers and LPs, as someone who is known to like, you know, read the tea leaves and answers to simple questions, what do you think is the superpower of asking the obvious question instead of asking a very convoluted question to get to a very specific point? So first of all, I think, I think the answers is different depending on who I am talking to, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, for example, when, when it comes to emerging majors due diligence, I prefer straight answer. Uh, here's the reason. The big, this is something I always tell uh, other managers as well, but big difference 
between startup investment and the fund investment is that the fund investment of the GP or emerging majors, they achieved something in the past, right? So they're all good. They're really good. Uh, but the, often they don't know who they're competing to, right? They're competing to equally uh, qualified people, right? So they try to, you know, uh, use these fancy words uh, to, you know, to make their fund look better. And it may work for many cases, but people like me who is whose day-to-day job is talking to emerging majors day in, day out, I don't, I just, you know, it doesn't matter. I just want what's their superpower is. Mm -hmm. Simple term, just simple term, right? What's their portfolio looks like, why they are doing this, um, so and so, right? Um, So, actually, for example, one of the really good examples is, uh, so sometimes, it doesn't happen often, but, who are really confident about their previous track record? It happened only twice in the past. They just copy and paste their Excel spreadsheet of their schedule investment into the deck. They didn't even bother make it better <laughs> because they're so confident with the number. Yeah. Right? And the number was fascinating. I'm like, wow, this is really, really good. Right? And it's, it's all like a fancy slide. And when it comes to the track record, it's just copy and paste from the Google spreadsheet. I'm like, okay. I mean, she, she, she did it because she's really confident, right? This is very simple, right? There's yeah. no, like, no uh, 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 footnotes. It's just, it, it is. So I think it's so, when it comes to, I think I always encourage emerging majors to just use a simple word, um, straightforward. On the other hand, uh, going back to our due diligence question, uh, the conversation with foods and founders, right? I think it's a reference call has a lot of nuance, right? Um, no one wants to say bad things about their investors. Yeah. And no one wants to say something bad about their co-investors, right? So my job is to find out uh, this subtle nuance, right? Um, so I try to ask questions sometimes it's direct but because it has to be direct right uh like for example like what did she help with like did he help right but sometimes it's nuanced for example i ask how often do you speak to the managers how often do you speak to the gp right and i ask that question if the gp said oh i you know i help founders a lot like i'm the one of those first people who the founders make a phone call right but if the founders answer to my question about how frequent their communication is it's like, oh yeah, once a month, like once every couple of weeks. You know, that's like, you know, a little bit different from from what I expected, right? So sometimes the when it comes to reference calls, I think there's a lot of these nuanced the questions. Um and I always try to find uh uh DG uh DGQ uh for <laughs> the news because it's much difficult, right? When it comes to yeah. nuanced questions. Um but when it comes to those emerging the the manager of due diligence, I think it's more direct and I prefer direct uh, conversation. I'm imagining in my head as you're describing it is when you're asking a DGQ to like a reference call a portfolio company, right. it's a lot more of tango and salsa where there's a bit more flourish to the dance. There's a lot more like yeah. artistry that goes on outside of the, the yeah. strict dance itself. And it's very beautiful exactly. to watch. Don't get, don't get me wrong. And on the flip side, yeah, yeah. Um, when you ask a very simple questions, so we're going to go back to Japan because we started the conversation with Japan. So I might as well like bring this back is I'm a big foodie. I love my food. And what I'm imagining is the simple question that's very direct is like the equivalent of sushi and uh, like you oh, know, omakase. Cool. And it's like straight, like if you can't hide yeah. the freshness of the fish, right? You go to an omakase restaurant, they give you a fish and they give you a, 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 like a, some, some rice underneath and that's it. Right. You can't yeah. hide behind anything versus yep. Um, if you, if you, if someone like adds a lot of things in their pitch deck effectively of like, Hey, there's all these wonderful colors and bright like logos and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's probably more a heavily sauced food. I actually had this conversation. I forget, mm-hmm. uh, um, I forget who this was, but this was like one of those like fine dining chefs who's won their James Beard award. And James Beard is equivalent of like oh. the Pulitzer prizes of like, you know, books and all that kind of stuff. And one thing he told me like really resonated, which is like, if, if you go to a restaurant, I want you to notice their tables. Their tables are very, very important. And I was like, why, 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 why is it, why are tables important? 
And yeah. he said, um, if you go to a, a great restaurant, you will notice that their tables will not have tablecloths because they will not have all the blemishes in their table because the wood in which they use is solid wood. You know, it's good redwood. It's good. Like, I don't know my woods. Um, it, it's good birch wood, whatever <laughs> it is. Right. And it's right. stable. It, like when you move the table, there's no like, and there's no angling and there's like, it doesn't right, teeter right, back right, and right. forth. But if you go to cheaper restaurants that try to look a little better, there's always a tablecloth on the table because there are Interesting. bite marks. The, the, the table looks less new. They probably bought it secondhand or whatever it was. And so he, like, obviously he was huh. self-promotional. He's like, our tables at our restaurant do not have tablecloths. And you can notice that every other great restaurant that in fine dining restaurants, that you actually and really, really enjoyed, enjoyed the whole experience, they probably also don't have tablecloths. And I was like, oh, it's very fascinating. That's what I imagine when, when you're seeing very a pitch fascinating. deck with just the track record, an Excel spreadsheet screenshot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying people should not decorate it, right? Uh, I think looking good is good. It's important. It's like going back to our brand conversation, right? But um, I think it's, it's a balance, right? Yeah. Uh, too much is just too much. So. I mean, most fund managers hire someone to design their deck. Like the mm -hmm. number of deck designers that are out there that fund managers hire is immense. And it's a whole market altogether. And oftentimes yeah. when an LP is seeing a deck, it is, it has been looked over by a designer who is not necessarily an industry expert when it comes to VC or LP and all that kind of stuff. And so for you, when you're looking at a deck, you mentioned an example of the track record just being an Excel sheet. You only had two ex two examples of that. Are there other right. telltale signs of what is signal in a desk deck, despite everything looking very colorful in nature? I don't, I'm not sure whether I'm answering your question, but uh, one of the things people, the emerging majors, think special, but not really special, is the, their LP. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's becoming more and more common for other GPs investing in those emerging majors as a form of support or, or, at, or whatever reasons, right? So some, sometimes managers, emerging majors, like, you know, whispering me, hey, actually, who's who GPs investing, invested in a fund, right? But for me, that's, oh, you're like one of those uh, 10 funds that he invested, in, right? Um, because, again, it's becoming more and more common. So now I think it's kind of becoming table stake. If I see a fund manager without any of those GPs with as an LP, I question it. Like why why anyone no one invests in your fund? Like is it your intentional decision or because you don't have any connections to them? Right? Um so that's one of the things I I I, I you know find interesting. And especially so I imagine if that GP who's pitching you has co-invested with these other GPs that typically LP into other funds. Mm. Because if you're claiming yes. they're great co-investors and they have you on the cap table all the time, there's a big assumption that you know them well and they trust you enough where they will allocate an, a small, no matter how big of a check, but a small LP check into your fund. Actually, that's a good point. Yeah, if their valid prop is the, being a great co-investor for those whales, yeah, and, and they don't have if they don't have any uh, the LPs from those wills. That's a that's a red flag. I love it. Okay, we are we went completely on schedule, but I <laughs> freaking love this. I do like maybe my last hard hitting question, so to speak. Sure. Um, I want to talk about the LPAC, and one of my favorite people in the venture is Paige Doherty at Behind Genius Ventures. She has gone on record to say, Young Rock, one of my LPAC members, LP Advisory Committee, that's what LPAC stands for, is someone I meet with very often. And since Gree backed us in Fund One, he has seen my growth as a fund manager. Our LPAC offers a great and critical lens into the industry. And so in the topic of being an LPAC member, and I know you're, you're, you're like, you know, you're, you're exploring a lot of things as well in terms of like, you're, you're constantly trying to grow as an LPAC member as well. But in your mind, what makes a great LPAC member? So I think it's similar to company board, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of differences. I would say it is more flexible. So I have a two board experience uh, to the start of one as a board member and the one as a board observer. And, you know, the typical board things meet every quarter, discuss this company projections, et cetera. LPEC, I'm uh, sitting in LPEC for three funds, including pages, but uh, no fund has that kind of formal forum to 
discuss the critical matters, right? And I think it, it's the, the, the typical way to, uh, way of uh, how LPEC works. Instead, it's more flexible and more opportunistic. Whenever there is a critical questions or critical decisions the fund managers has to make, she, uh, she or he uh, comes to the LPEC and discuss what's the best uh, uh, options for everyone, uh, for herself, companies, and uh, LPs, and make a decision. And topic could be very various, right? Um, it ranges. Um, so I think a good LPEC is available, reachable uh, for managers at any time and have experience and access to the information if she doesn't have uh, to the questions that GPs need to solve. You're on, you mentioned you're on three LPAC committee, like, you know, LP advisory committees. What are typical kinds of questions that GPs ask you that, um, that might be helpful for LPs on this conversation to also prepare an answer or to think deeply about? So I think there's a two things actually when it comes to questions from GP. One is in order to, it's more legal stuff. They have to talk to LPAC to change major terms. For example, if GP, it's, it's a different by LPA by LPA, uh, limited partnership agreement. Um, but sometimes LPAC has to give the GP green light for the terms like uh, extending uh, uh, closing date, right? Uh, so in, in that case, GPs, you know, get an approval from LPAC first and then get an approval from other LPs as well. Um, or other thing is a general, uh, um, general questions, right? For example, hey, um, we are debating one of the questions uh, we recently got is, uh, uh, we want to extend our uh, investment period. Uh, what do you think is the best, like extending it or not? Right. So it's a more, it's a consult, uh, a consultation, right? Um, so it, and, and nothing to do with the LPA at that point. If they make a decision to extend it, probably they have to make a decision, the, the more updated LPA. But you know, it was just more conversation. So they send an email to every LPAC, um, and, and we just had a you know, it was not even a call. Was a is email conversations, um, yeah. So it's a more legal stuff or more, you know, consulting kind of stuff. I want to scratch my own itch here to the question of should you extend your investment period or like should we extend our um, and like we as in a royal we kind of thing, right? But right. Um, how does one start thinking about extending investment periods? Because most investment periods are what two to four years, give or take. I think it's airing a lot on two, right. three to four years. If someone is extending, I'm imagining that they're extending into the fifth year. If it, the, most, the, most cases, LPAs, uh, the actual investment period is a shorter than the, what LPA you know, says, right? So it's a matter of original investment periods of two years, but extending into two and a half years. Mm -hmm. But LPA says, Invest periods of four years. So mm -hmm. as long as invest periods are within four years, that's fine. Actually, that's happening to our our very own fund, uh, which we had a final close uh, back in uh, October. Oh, congratulations! Um, thank you so much. Yes, um, yeah, back in October 2023, last year, from the time that uh, this episode is going to be released. Um, and uh, originally, our LPA says we can invest it in the fund into the in the four years from the, from the first close uh, but our internally our strategy was two years of the cooling period right mm -hmm. but now we are planning to extend it to two and a half years uh, roughly um, and that is because we had a very slow deployment uh, pace early this year because because the market was uh, kind of slowed up right yeah. um, but to answer your question I think it's depending on the situation and if it changes like half year or year i don't think that changes a lot of dynamics um and it's not critical uh, mm -hmm. in most cases uh, except it, it, unless the investment period itself is a core strategy um yeah that was my last hard-hitting question to you now we're going to take things a little bit more lightheartedly um sure i had a chat with linus who i know you know well cool. at kyber knight yeah um and he mentioned that when he first met you, you were both taking a walk on Lafayette Park. Yes. And he distinctly remembers how thoughtful you were and 
how you were one of the few LPs, and I'll quote this, like you were one of the few LPs there who wanted to understand the person you were talking to as a human being, not just as an investor. So I'm curious for you, as you're getting to know a fund manager, not the normal kind of like, oh, what's your uh, investment track record? How do you think about what is your superpower? What are your weaknesses? None of those things, right? But I'm curious, do you have any questions you usually keep in your back pocket to better understand or better get to know someone? I don't have any like single question that I ask to understand or build actually like a report as a person. Uh, But I think I have... uh, you know, uh, this kind of instinct uh, to learn about uh, someone, some other people's personality and stuff by just spending time uh, and talking about non-work related, you know, topics. And I think understanding that part is important because, you know, um, as we all know, the venture capital fund investment is 10 years horizon. But, But at the same time, you know what? At the same time, those personal touch is becoming less important. Mm-hmm. I know it's a counter argument. It's kind of intuitive from what you just asked me, right? It was important and it is still important. But I think it's becoming less important. Because you think about it, like you as a GP, David, now let's say you're running a fund. You're on, you're an emerging major. You're running $20 million of a fund. And you're investing AI, right? And you have a, and, and you, I'm a, I'm a also emerging major who are investing in B2B or AI as well. And I'm a really good friend of you as a GP, right? And you already share this investment opportunities, et cetera. But this company, your portfolio company, it, which is going to be blockbuster for your company, right? Mm-hmm. And now you have an option to share the opportunity with me or bigger brand, you know, who has a strong presence in the AI space, but you don't know them well. But you know their brands is going to help your portfolio companies to to grow significantly, right? Who are you going to share the deal with, right? Yeah, as a, as a fiduciary, um, you you probably want the ones that make the most sense for your LPs for why people trusted you with their capital. Which unfortunately, right. in this example, sounds like it's going to be the latter. At least I would choose the latter. Right, right. So I think when it comes to emerging majors or fund in general, as the competition becomes more and more fierce in, in the venture capital investment, I think it's personal relationship is still very important, right? I don't get me wrong, but it's it's personal personal relationship plus what value each person, whether it's LP or GP, can provide, right? Um, so. In addition to building good relationship with LPs uh, or GPs, um, if thinking about as a as a LP or GP, what kind of value they can provide to other people uh, is is becoming equally important. Um, and I think I, I I'm telling that myself as well because in the past LP is an LP. They just put the money and do nothing um, and try to just get the information and deals, right? Yeah. Um, but going forward. I think uh, LP is going to, the role of the LP uh, is going to be a little more than that uh, because it is not, it's going to become more, more than just personal relationship. Right. I do think that the best fund managers over communicate and they proactively communicate with their LPs. So let's say in the example that I have an AI company that is doing very, very well and like we would love to see a great markup for the company. Right. And the option comes down to, should we share this with a GP at a very established, very well-known fund that can definitely help them get to the next stage versus an LP who would like to co-invest? And let me know if I'm wrong here. I guess there's no right or wrong answer, but like how I imagine sure. to approach it is like, hey, um, we have this great company and I know you'd love to co-invest because this is usually the stage in which you co-invest. But... I want to be the best fiduciary for your capital. And for that, my primary motivation for this fund is financial return back to you for being an LP and us. And because of that, I'm going to make this decision to share this deal with this fund that unless they pass for whatever reason, I'm happy to share that to you. But I want to make sure that I'm communicating this with you and it's not a surprise. Yeah. David, as you said, this is uh, really... 
tough conversation, right? It's a tough conversation. Uh, yeah, because depending on LP, their mandate is different, right? Some yeah. LP is invested in because because their fiduciary duty is probably sharing the deal source. Yeah, right. But for me, for uh, LPs like us, we we don't do co investment, so we want our managers to do to make the fund multiple as high as possible, right? So I think the the conversation looked very different. If you if you if you say that to me, like, oh yeah, go ahead, like talk to whoever are the best right. the following investors, right? But if you talk to, for example, other GP who invested in you as, as a deal sourcing channel, like they're gonna they're not gonna be happy. And even if you stay transparent, I don't know whether that makes them feel better because they try really hard to win the deal. That's because true. you're this because the primary motivation for them is for deal flow, at least for those that have mandates. And so I guess it comes down to the discussion of like, if, if you're a GP listening to this, depending on how, what kind of fund manager you want to be, um, you should communicate that to your LPs from the very beginning and then right. um, determine that if your fund is set up as a deal flow channel for them, you're going to be capping your own TDPI, DPI and all that. But as long as you can sleep well at night and you are doing so, like, hey, you know what? The purpose of my fund is like an like a, a like an early stage scout fund effectively for the LP, then I think everything makes sense. Yeah, but at the same time, when it comes to LP, you know, there must be good LPs, good GPLP as well, right? Yeah. So maybe GP can find the best possible options among their GPLPs who can drive the value um, at the maximum level to that company. So maybe they can share the deal with the LPs um, as well. That's fair. All right. Um, Young Rock, I want to play one last game before we, we end off here. And uh, you've been incredibly sure. thoughtful. Um, but I'm going to share you. a few numbers. And I'd love for you to share the first thing that comes to mind, just because I want to see your knee-jerk reaction when it comes to these things. If this game falls sure. flat, we'll edit out and post. But let's see how far we can go with this. For sure. example, if I say the number 46, you'd say something like the number of chromosomes in a human body. 23, right. you'd say Jordan's number, Michael Jordan's number. Two, management yeah. fee. 1.5, the number of times James Bond says his own name when introducing himself. Uh, um, so I'm going to give you a couple numbers. So are you ready? Yes. Before we jump into this, yes. when you say 46, 46 means me. Oh. Yes. So 40 is a young rock. If you... In Japanese, my name is pronounced as a yon roku. Uh -huh. And yon means four, roku means six. So often one of my friends would say, hey, 46. So that's my name. So that's the that's not chromosome. It's me. I, <laughs> I love that fun fact. You may find yourself yeah. with a couple emails or DMs in your inbox anytime soon where instead of saying, hey, young rock, they say, hey, 46. Yes. <laughs> that yeah. said, you'll know if they call you out as, hey, 46, that have one, listen to the podcast. And then two, it's not some mail merge CRM kind of thing. They've actually spent attention and time getting to know you, which is why they're calling you by 46 instead of Young Rock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who knows? I mean, it may work. I don't know if it'll work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Personalization, right? Personalization. We'll see how that turns out. All right. Yeah. So we'll start easy. 20. 20 is the size of the fund, emerging major fund, that I'm going to be really comfortable. 30. Oh, 30 uh, is 20 to 30 is the range of the size <laughs> that I'm going to be really comparable uh, with uh, when it comes to emerging major fund. Seriously, yeah. I mean, 10 is, 10 is our kind of minimum. 50, I think it's a, it can be big, but we can go 50. Uh -huh. right? uh, 20, 30 is, I think, a sweet spot, which can have you know, a good amount of reserve and still stay as collaborators to with a big big guys right um yeah okay i love it and then 100 100 too many portfolio mm, okay okay and lastly five five um five um knee-jerk reaction doesn't have to be about venture five. Yeah, five is. I think it's the time, a number of times that I went to Japan last year. <laughs> <laughs>
because I usually go to Japan every quarter. Uh huh. But I think I went there one more, so I think five times. I Which think... means I had an omakase, not omakase, but sushi five times as well. That's a, in, in Japan. Sushi in Japan is, for those who have never been, um, I, I, I would just like highly, highly, highly recommend it. It really changes your mind of how fresh fish can be, but also how simplicity goes a long way.、Um, So, anyways, Young Rock, this has been thoroughly enjoyable. Like, I wish we had more time. We've already、Likewise. gone like, a very long、uh, for this, but、um, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how, how we do in our, in our edits here.、Um, the listeners、cool. may end up getting the unfiltered version, but, you know, <laughs> everything, ev- everything was just like drops of wisdom, like drops of gold. I absolutely loved it. I know,、Thank、Young you、so、Rock, you're everywhere.、It. You're on socials, you're on LinkedIn, Twitter, email, and all that. But if people were to choose, what would be your preferred method of communication? I'm a, I'm a little old guy, so I prefer email or LinkedIn.、Uh, I try to do a better job in LinkedIn and the socials. So,、uh, yeah, those two channels will be the best way to reach me. Okay, you say you're old. You don't look a day over like 30. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, become, uh, turning into 40 next month or so.、Uh, so, at the time it is released, I'm already 40. So. Well, congratulations.、Um, Thank you so much. People stay tuned for this.、Uh, we'll, we'll see when this actually gets pushed out. But as of the time in which I told Young Rock this will be out,、um, you might be able to squeeze in a happy birthday in that intro email or that when they reach out.、Uh, Young Rock, this has been thoroughly enjoyable.、Um, I've loved every second of this. Thank you for spending your time with us. Thank you so much, David, for having me. Thanks for asking the question. No one asked that question before. Hello, Supercluster fans. You've seen the logo at the beginning. And now we're here to address the elephant in the room. And the big question is how intertwined is Superclusters and Alchemist Accelerator? And the truth is, Superclusters and Alchemist Accelerator are two completely separate entities. Other than the fact that it is only I, David, your host, who is able to traverse between the multiverses. And so the reason Alchemist is a sponsor for Superclusters is the same reason why I ended up joining Alchemist.、Um, and it's for two reasons. The team and the product. So let me elaborate a little bit. For the team side, I was doing a bunch of diligence, homework, reference checks before I joined Alchemist. And I stumbled across a story with, which was between Ravi and an early team member of Alchemist.、Um, and for the sake of this story, I'm going to call that person John. So Ravi and John were working late at night because they had a deadline coming up. And as they were about to leave, Ravi found out that John didn't have a place to stay and had been sleeping out of his car the entire time. And the next thing Ravi did literally blew my mind, which was Ravi gave the keys to his place to John and said, John, you're free to stay here for as long as you want. And I knew instantly that this is the team I wanted to join. This is the, the, the culture I wanted to be a part of.、Um, the second thing is the product itself.、Uh, Alchemist has built this really robust product called the Vault. And it is the epitome of Peter Drucker's infamous line, which is, you cannot manage what you don't measure. And so, for the uninitiated, what is Alchemist Accelerator? Alchemist Accelerator is your startup accelerator for companies that monetize from enterprises. And so, don't take it just from me.、Uh, we've backed incredible companies, including names you've heard of LaunchDarkly, Prevacera, Mo Engage. And we're also backed by some incredible LPs and investors, including Coastal Ventures, Mayfield, Salesforce. And now, Between you and I, I can't share any of the numbers. And if I do, my compliance officer, our compliance officer, will literally gobble me up for breakfast, lunch, afternoon tea, and dinner. And personally, I'm too young to die. And, but I will say, the numbers, they're great. Like, they're really great. And so, if you're curious and want to get involved in Alchemist、um, and the ecosystem, check out alchemistaccelerator.com. Backslash superclusters. And that's superclusters with an S at the beginning and at the S at the end. And we'll also include these links in the notes. Hey, superclusters fans, this is David from Post and want to share a few things before you go. If you're tuning in from the YouTube universe and if you like this episode and you want to see more of it, consider subscribing. It's free. Let us know down in the comments which LPs you'd want to see next or topics you liked and want to hear more of. If you're tuning in from the audio universe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever content finds your ear, and you like what you heard, give us a follow. 
And lastly, want to share a quick disclaimer from our legal friends. While I am the head of investor relations at Alchemist Accelerator, and that Alchemist Accelerator is one of our proud sponsors, the views expressed in this episode are for informational purposes only and are solely the views of myself and the guest alone. They are not representative of Alchemist Accelerator. None of the views expressed herein constitute legal, investment, business, or tax advice, and any allusions or references to funds or companies are purely for illustrative purposes only and should not be relied upon as investment recommendations. Consult a professional investment advisor near you prior to making any investment decisions. And that's all from me. See you on the next.